Well, hello, everyone. This is Al Fadi, and I'd like to welcome you to a special edition of our Let Us Reason uh, live stream. With us today, a very special guest, a sister in Christ who is a former Muslim, and she will be sharing her testimony with us. Uh, she goes by the name Daughter of Christ. Maybe some of you have heard her before on Sister Hatoon's uh, YouTube channel, uh, but we are honored that she have also accepted uh, our invitation to her and took the time with us today to uh, be able to share that journey uh, with all of us. And uh, we invite, of course, all of you to not only tune in, but hopefully you can take the information and share it with others, especially our Muslim friends, especially females. And obviously, for obvious reasons, because she left Islam, and there is always this uh, element of risk on the life of those who dare to share the truth openly. Uh, she does not show her face, and we support that uh, wholeheartedly, uh, simply because we understand the risk ourselves as an apostate myself as well. With that says, I want to welcome all of you who are with us here right now. And uh, we want to pay attention, of course, uh, direct your attention, I should say, to the moderators. I hope uh, that you will be paying close attention to their guidance, directions. Uh, no distractions, no foul language, no abusive language, no attempts whatsoever to derail the conversations. If you don't know me, hopefully you will know me today. I would say, if you don't know me by now, hopefully you will get to know me today, that I pay attention to every comment and I will personally get involved and I will put you in timeout myself or I'll even block you. It's, to me, it's not about having uh, people just subscribe and come here just to cause chaos. That's not what I'm about. Our channel is about educating people about the truth. And that, that mandates that we pay attention, of course, to the topic. Uh, today's, today's topic is not about the Trinity. Today's topic is not about the corruption of the Bible. Today's topic is not about the deity of Christ. Today's topic is about the journey that a brave young lady have taken out of Islam into the arms of Christ. If you're here for that, we welcome you. If you're not here for that, rest assured you will not enjoy the rest of this live stream because you're not going to be even able to access it after this. Thank you again, dear sister. And I want to just uh, apologize for all this lengthy introduction, but I find it necessary sometimes to do so. Again, I want to welcome you uh, here and uh, please take it from here. Hello, brother. Peace of Christ be with you, my dear brother al Uh I'm so honored to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I've been okay. a big... I've been a big fan for for a long time, so it's uh, it's been great to see you. You know, an Arab voice for Christ, especially from Saudi. You know, the epicenter of Islam, and uh, obviously you come with the traditional dress and the uh, uh, oil and everything, the headdress. Uh, it's just a great witness for Christ to the glory of Christ that He can save people from even that place. Yes. You know, and save people who uh, are from the land of Muhammad, who speak the language of Muhammad, who know about him, and who've been raised in that kind of brainwashing. Uh, I'm uh, an Arab also, but I'm not from Saudi. Uh, I was uh, born in a Muslim family, uh, very regular uh, in terms of, you know, a uh, very normal family uh, in the Middle East. And um, I was born to uh, parents who were very strict Muslim parents. Uh, we were given a very um, strict Islamic education, like with the Quran and the Tajweed, we went to school, and also to the masjid, the mosque, as well in the summer holidays to get extra lessons and tuition and things like that. So it was very, very intense. <laughs> and uh, uh, male members of my family, they were um, hafiz. So they were they'd memorized the the Quran by heart, and I wore the hijab from very early age. It was that kind of environment where everybody's Muslim, everybody says it's the truth. Muhammad is the perfect man, you know. Um, I also grew up with uh, Islam talking bad about other religions, as you know. Uh, you know very well what it says. Many al Islam min. Surah 3, verse 85, whoever desires other than Islam as religion, never it will be accepted for him. So Islam actually talks down all religions, but as you know, it specifies Christians, it attacks Christians a lot in the Quran. 
there are lots of uh, verses like don't say three, you know, Surah 5 verse 73, uh, which is a lie, a lie about Christians that they worship three gods, but that's what I've been told. You know, they worship three gods and, uh, you know, like Hindus, they worship lots of gods. So that's right. So you're, you're told, uh, I think the reason they do that is they, if they knock down all religions in your mind, you have to accept because you have no other option. So whatever, you know, weirdness you find or ridiculousness you find, you will accept it because where, where else will you go? So that was my, um, my situation that that's how I grew up and I believed it. Yeah, and, and I, if you don't mind me just asking quickly, um, I, I know uh, in, in some parts of the Middle East, I should say, they're not at least as religious in every corner you go. In Saudi, obviously, it's the Sharia law is part of the law for the nation, mosques in every corner. You hear the call for prayer all the time. People are religious by nature. They study that at school. Was it like this? Was that your experience growing up? Or does it vary from town to town, village to village, city to city, and block to block? It wasn't as bad as Saudi. But, uh, you know, where where I lived, the government, they, they used to say Sharia, the Islamic Sharia is the source of laws. But they um, they use other laws. Uh, so it's a bit watered down, uh, but w the family where I grew up, it was they were very devout. There were waves of um, religious um, sort of um, groups. I, I don't want to give too much detail, but there was like a big coming back to Islam sort of movements. And uh, my parents were parts of those movements in that they wore, you know, the hijab, even the niqab at, at, at certain points, um, I, the ladies from my family. And I grew up, uh, I heard the Adhan five times a day. In my home, the Quran would be played, the recitation would be played 24 seven. My parents, my dad would stay up uh, at night for tahajjud prayer, you know, for people who, who know about this, this. These are extra prayers during the night. It was that kind of environment. And um, uh, I have people in my family who um, were training to become Imams. Um, but we we spoke about Muhammad a lot at home. Uh, we had like I don't know we call them circles, halakat circles. They're like circles of knowledge or uh, where, lessons basically, where you sit down, you have a, you talk about a hadith or a verse. It was very much like that. So I grew up very familiar with the Quran, very very familiar, and the hadith. Not just the Sahih hadith, the Hasan, even the Daif hadith. You know. So when I hear Muslims deny them, I'm just Flabbergasted! I can't believe it. They, uh, you wouldn't think that. So, back in the Middle East, where we come from, brother, we don't get these denials. You know, people know the deal: Quran and Hadith and Sira. Absolutely, absolutely. And I would like to interact later about this uh, movement that you're seeing in the West by Muslims who begin to deny now many things. But anyway, I don't want to distract you from the main topic here. Yeah, so uh, so that was my bringing, and I I didn't doubt. I I took it all in. I absorbed it. I believed it. I bought it, um, and I tried. Uh, living as a Muslim is very time consuming in terms of rituals. Uh, the the daily prayers prayers the wudu uh, they they take up a lot of time. Uh, the you know the extra prayers the time afterwards for supplications and all that we were I was taken up by all that and um but living as a Muslim when I grew up uh, my family moved to the west I thank God for that because you get you get exposure to something other than Islam <laughs> which is great uh you know you start seeing people living in different ways but I at home we still live the same life still live the same life yeah so inside still maintaining the same thing i mean if you don't mind me uh, your, pa your family was religious uh what, did they feel like they were forced to move was it uh seeking a job w what was the main reason uh, really for the move um the main reason is brother is a better life so it's that is interesting <laughs> that is absolutely interesting you know because i thought islam provides that answer right you know so that's why i'd ask you because i knew you're going to say something like this so elaborate a little bit further why did they think better life is found in the west 
It's very interesting, brother. And it's the same thing I noticed. They talk badly about the West, the Westerners. They have no morals. They don't have Islam. They live how they like. But the Islam that they live with in our home countries, they can't stand it. They can't stand the consequences of the religion that they're so devout, um, devoted to. But then I, when, when I ask that, they say, well, the reason our countries are so bad is because they've deviated from is the true Islam of Muhammad and the Sahaba, you know, the four, the four uh, rightly guarded caliphs. Uh, that was the golden age of Islam. We have to get back to that. So even though the whole country is Muslim and everybody tries as much as they can to adhere to the rules, they don't go far enough. It needs to be more in government. It needs to be more in le legislation so we can get back to that. So to me, yeah, it was the hypocrisy, you know, the people that we call less than because they don't follow Islam, we flock to them for a better life. And that's the reality. Do you think, uh, again, I mean, I, I, just, I, I feel like I'm at a point where we can ask some questions before you jump into the next phase. Do you think, I mean, honestly, uh, uh, is, is the jihad by immigration part of the agenda as why some Muslims feel like I'm going to get a better life in the West, but at the same time, I'll reestablish this utopian Islamic, uh, you know, culture that I am missing back home, which is awkward to think this way. But do you, do you feel like they're cap uh, capitalizing on maybe the weakness in the West, the naive, uh, you know, naivety in the West, that, that the government in the West are more, uh, uh, you know, open more, um, uh, you know, submissive, if you wish, to different cultures? I think there's an element of that. Uh, my family, when they came to the West, they just had in their minds just a better life in, in, in a, on an individ individual basis. But I know for a fact that Muslims, when they come to the West, they, even though they've escaped the countries that they don't like, they come here in the west and they try to establish back the same thing that they escaped from it just doesn't make any sense but they certainly do there's the welfare state they do um they do take benefits they do try and have as many kids as possible and we have i have seen that because we're trying to outnumber them yeah we're trying to have more it's this it's the it's the numbers thing it's we're trying to make the uh, our presence known and they do that especially in aid you know, times when they pray in the streets, it's like a show of numbers, a show of strength. Uh, we're here to stay. They, they try to get a little bit more and more rights. They try to get the Sharia. So you get these pockets uh, of the places where the, the Muslim dense, where the Sharia is um, applied, you know, first of all, to family law. So you have like a, almost like a state within a state where the Sharia laws are applied. Um, where Muslims are and they are get, and they are doing you know they are going uh, steps and steps forward in, in that regard yeah so I'm gonna I have a question related to what you just said uh, from uh, a Muslim uh, you know his name is Adil Ahmed uh, so uh, it's interesting what he's saying so if you feel comfortable answering it uh, directly or indirectly it's up to you I'm gonna put it on the screen right now for the benefit of everybody to see so you said something about the Islamic rituals and it mm -hmm. gets tiring, which I agree with you 100%. It's, it preoccupies you all the time. So here's his question. What would you say to that? Uh, are you tired of making wudu, praying salah, reciting the glorious Quran? In general, are you saying you're tired, worshipping Almighty Allah? Uh, the reason I'm tired, uh, or I was tired, I'm, I'm now with her, I'm under the grace of Christ, is because it's you're going around in circles. Yeah. You're praying all the time you're doing this they are rituals it's not prayer like we talk about in christian prayer it's you say the same thing three times you you bow three times you you do you you, you go do sujus three times you prostrate three times, three times it's like a following a robotic ocd regime that's completely empty and if i was getting something out of it then it wouldn't be in vain but there was nothing out of it it was like you know did god just make me into a robot so i can just uh waste my the years of my life just doing these rituals over and over and over and over and with nothing at the end of it it just seems complete and there's no there's no heart in it you're just because there's so many movements you there's no way you can focus for long enough to, you know about what you're saying and what you're saying doesn't come from the heart 
uh, Adil, you know full well that when you uh, you're standing in salah, you're uh, saying verses that are already in the Quran. So Allah is giving you the stuff to say. He's telling you what to do. He's making you follow robotic movements over and over. You know, he should have just uh, created robots if he wanted that kind of worship. With There's no heart in it. And to be honest, uh, uh, brother al Fadi, there were a bunch of Bedouin uh, Arabs in the desert. So they had all the times in the world. They didn't have a job. They didn't have study. You could do that five times a day and spend about 15 minutes with uh, tasbih with, um, afterwards and then start again and start again. If you have any kind of job or study or anything, all these rituals, they take ages. Your wudu, then the salah, then the tasbih. Then you do the extra rakahs afterwards. Then you do the tasbih, which is the supplications. Supplications are, you say, subhanallah, uh, each of them 33 times. What's the point of that? Subhanallah 33 times. Alhamdulillah 33 times. Uh, Layla Allah 33 times. Allah Akbar 33 times. Why? Yeah, because you're planting trees <laughs> in heaven. Didn't you know this? I was planting gardens every time I did that. When I came to Christ, Jesus Christ says, uh, when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think they will be heard for their many words. Amen. So if it, what you are saying really mattered, why can't you just say it once to Allah with heart? Why does he need to hear it 33 times for it to he's matter? He's hard of hearing, dear sister. <laughs> he's hard of hearing. He only speaks Arabic. He's hard of hearing. And he's picky also. He doesn't like some prayers and he throws it in your face and he accepts only some. That's all he does. It's so laughable, brother. It's... So if you say it 32 times but or 34 times, no, it has to be 33 times. Or he doesn't hear, it's like Allah has OCD or something. Uh, the numbers matter. Remember, and remember, uh, Aydel, if you, if you say your prayer in Arabic, like Brother Al-Fari just says, he doesn't accept it. Even though he created all these nations with all these uh, languages, if you say your prayer, it's exactly the same words in English or any other language that you speak, it is not accepted. Why? Because Allah is a pagan god. He's a he's a god of the Arabs. It's a is a local god. So, you know, I, I when we pray, when I pray now to God, I go to a church where there are at least three languages spoken. Everybody's praying in their language, and God hears every single single language, and He answers every single prayer. And I pray in Arabic and English. Come on, brother. And you don't have to even go to a building to pray. You can pray anytime. You feel a relationship with the Savior. You don't have to wait for the specific prayer time to be able to do mechanical rituals. You know, I love it when the Quran in one chapter is, you know, you know, to uh, and uh, it repeats over and over and over and over and over. Why? Because repetition helps you just memorize. And once you memorize, you cannot think. You cannot process things. You cannot analyze things. There is either you memorize it and you don't think about it, or you critique it as you are reading it. And of course, uh, that's the difference between the God of the Bible and the God of the Quran. And here is uh, Adil's response, by the way, uh, which is classic. I'm, I'm just trying to make people here uh, who are following us, uh, sincerely watching us right now, get a flavor and a taste of the double standards that you get from Muslims. Here's Adel's response to what you just said. He said, SubhanAllah, I never heard of this kind of logic in my entire life. Adel, I have some bad news for you. You're a bad Muslim. That's why you've never heard of it. Your standards actually are better than your God. And you are not following the true teaching of Islam. So why don't you go and study Islam before you come here and waste our time with your dumb questions? Does that work? Anyway, so you moved to the West. What happened yeah. after that? So, uh, yeah, I moved. I grew up a bit older. And, brother, um, I had a very loving family. And I was doing everything I was told to my to the best of my ability. But I was I was miserable. I was miserable. Uh, I had emptiness in my heart. I, I woke up every day with fear, uh, with worry. Uh, it, it, the best way to describe it is it's as if I lost something and I'm searching for it and I can't find it and I can't rest. You see, I couldn't enjoy anything. I had no joy in doing anything because I don't know. No Muslim knows they're standing with Allah. No one, know, no Muslim knows where they will go after they die. 
even even though you give him everything, he gives you nothing. He doesn't give you any reassurance. I don't know where I stand with him. And that was a problem for me because um, I don't know how to get there. You know, I'm, even Muhammad himself, um, he's saying, he said that he didn't know where he was going after death. Uh, and he said in he it says in the Quran, I don't know I don't know what will happen to me or you. And Allah to me was this God that uh, requires all these uh, duties, but doesn't give you anything in in return. Uh, I was the same as an unbeliever in terms of He's not giving me anything. He's not the Quran doesn't talk. It's meant to be Allah's words and doesn't never talks about inner peace. Doesn't talk about inner peace. He's not giving, all it talks about is the unbelievers this, the unbelievers that. They were threatening the unbelievers, basically, as if he had a chip on his shoulder. And um, to me, that's, that was a big problem uh, in that you mentioned, brother, before, relationship with God. The Quran, there's no such thing as a relationship. That word is not in the Quran. Muhammad doesn't talk about relationship with God. What there is is duties. You do your duty every day. And it's a guessing game. You just wish for the best. And after a point, I, I just, you think, well, wh when do I get to find out? Or oh, you find out after death. <laughs> it's too late then, <laughs> you know? Uh, so I was in this, I was in this um, uh, circle. I was in this never ending cycle of like chasing my, my tail, basically, just ritual after ritual, work after work, nothing, empty words, no change in my heart. And, um, Allah in the Quran, he talks about changing the heart. He says, you have to change your heart. He says, um, uh, uh, he says, nothing will change for a people until they change their hearts. He says, in Allah, he doesn't change them until they change themselves. So it's all on you. It's all you. You climb your way to me, basically. And it's a constant guessing game. Uh, I ask for forgiveness hundreds of times. I don't know if I'm forgiven or not. I give lots of charity. I don't know if he accepts it or not. I do all the prayers with all the sincerity. I, I can try and muster with all the roboticness of it. I don't, like you said, brother, before, he can just chuck it in your face, can throw it back in your face on the day of judgment. Uh, and it says in the Quran, you should not um, trust the deception of Allah. Only those who are disbelievers, uh, you can't, it's basically you're serving a God that you can't trust. Um, and I heard a, a saying as well that um, one of the Sahaba, one of the companions, say, used to, you know, said, "If I had one foot in the in paradise and one foot outside it, I would not trust the deception of Allah. He would not trust that Allah would let him." That's Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr. Abu yes, God bless you. The closest companion of Muhammad among the first five who believed whose daughter Aisha was six when Muhammad who was 51 proposed to her and consummated the marriage when she was nine this is Abu Bakr says yeah. basically I mean this is the guy who is the closest companion to Muhammad because Muhammad told him when he during the Isra and Mi'raj you know when he ascended to heaven Muhammad told him he says you know Abu Bakr, uh, Gabriel took me to a huge, huge, huge site in heaven and told me that this is yours. And that was his response to this. Instead of celebrating, it tells you that no one really took Muhammad seriously. No one believed in every word that he was saying. He probably was watching Muhammad changing his mind every now and then. <laughs> Very much so, brother. So remember, I believe this stuff. So I was living this constant fear that if, if even the Sahaba, you know, like you said, the closest to Muhammad, they didn't know. Muhammad himself, Muhammad himself, he didn't know where he was going. Um, there's a story, uh, the background of Surah 46, verse 9, where, uh, you know, where someone says, someone dies, his name is Uthman ibn Mad'un, he dies, and then uh, the Sahaba were saying, oh, Allah will honor him. Muhammad says, how do you, how do you say, uh, why do you say, how do you know Allah will honor him? I'm the messenger of Allah and I don't know if, where I go after death. That's from Ibn Kathir. So I, I, that, so I was thinking, even if they didn't know, what about me? And obviously, you know, the horror stories, the film, the horror movie, uh, narratives of, uh, the, uh, torture in the grave, the stuff that will happen to you with every missed prayer, you you'll get. Yeah, <laughs> <I can't wanna> <laughs> <hear>. <laughs> 
<laughs> you'll get the two angels that you know hit you with a hammer for every you know for every prayer that you miss you get a uh, the, the the snake that will eat your flesh that's for believers that's not for non-believers what about um, the questions they're gonna ask you <laughs> i mean i was hoping to god that they don't change the curriculum on us when we die because they may may have missed some of the questions the new questions that he's added it's always like i have to remind myself literally of the questions in case i died so i can <laughs> answer them Exactly, brother. You know this. So, uh, yeah, same with me. I, I would be, you know, sitting there thinking, okay, Man Rabbuk, who's your Lord? Allah is my Lord. Uh, who's your, you know, who's your, um, who's the mess messenger? Allah is the, me uh, Muhammad is the messenger. You, you know, you say these things and it's so ludicrous now that looking back at it, uh, and that's another point I want people to know is I wasn't, I wasn't saved by my intellect or perceptiveness because I was adult when I believed all this stuff. It's by the spirit of God, you know. Um, so we pray for Muslims because only the spirit of God that now we laugh at it, but I was adult when I believed this. Um, but for me, I, I basically, I just wanted a way to make sure I was safe as a Muslim and I couldn't find it. And that was my problem, but I was still a believer until, until at that point. And then, um, I asked, I asked how I shared this with my family that I, I, I don't feel right. I, I have things, sins of the heart. I know God can see that I'm not good. I don't know if he's forgiving me. And what do I do? I'm sincere. And the answer would always be read the Quran more, do more, pray more. But I was already, already doing that. But, you know, do more is always the answer. But the problem is when I read the Quran, I felt worse because Allah in the Quran is just, he's just, he loves to talk about the unbelievers and how much he will destroy them, how much he will uh, torture them. It's just this sadistic the sadistic person, um, like, you know, uh, I will pour boiling water over your head. I will drag you through chains. I will, uh, you will eat, you know, boiling oil in your tummies. And, and, you know, it would just, it just made me more scared, more afraid of this God, not closer to him. And he would even, if he wants to destroy someone, he would send uh, he would he would make them sin, and then he will destroy them. He says that in Surah 17, Surah Al Isra, uh, if we intend to destroy a city, we command the as affluence to disobey, and then we destroy it. So he makes them sin. And in another surah, he says, we send the devils upon the disbelievers. Inna arsalna shaytan ala al kafirin the uzum as we sent the devils upon the disbelievers to incite them to do evil. So I was just disturbed by this. Um, the the character of Allah in the Quran is just it can, it can never be God. It was it did so. The more I read the Quran, the more I felt like I was less sincere. Now I was further away from Him and more afraid, terrified. Um, and that that was that was a struggle. So um, I'm sure, growing up, you've also heard about the uh, status of women according to Islam, whether they're good, the ugly, or bad, the bad or the yeah. ugly, I should say. Uh, what was your reaction, especially uh, to what is mandated of you as a female when you are preparing to get married and how you're gonna treat your husband? What about the idea that a husband have a right to abuse and beat his wife? What about what Muhammad says that he have notice or witness that the majority of the occupants uh, of hellfire were female i mean did you come across any of these teachings growing up and how did you feel about them oh yes yes of course of course i did especially living back home uh i didn't like them of course and any woman who says she likes them she's lying what we're told to do as women is you're shamed you know this is what allah says and that's the creator. What are you going to disbelieve? You know, you have to accept. So obviously, you know, the verses that say men have a degree over women. Uh, so my brother, even though I excel in so many things, like uh, in my family, I excelled um, in terms of academics by far. But he inherits twice as much as I do. He, he may well squander the money but he inherits her twice as much as I do. My testimony in court is half of his. And I really didn't like the verse that says, um, you know, two women, so if, if one 
if one is misguided, the other the other one reminds us her. In tadal wahida fatuzakar ahdahum al akhra. That's right. That's right. Why did he? Why does Allah assume that I will be that I will forget or be misguided? Is there an assumption there? Well, I mean, uh, a smart uh, lady asked Muhammad the same question. What was his answer to her? Because uh, we have periods, <laughs> so. Um, and the, the mind also, he says that women yeah. are deficient. You know, w women are brain. deficient. Yeah, women are deficient because uh, in the brain, because we, one witness is uh, a woman's witness is half the witness of a man. But who came up with that? He did. So you're the one who said it. So you're using your own assumption to say it's like circ a circular argument. But he was talking to women who believed him as a prophet. That's the thing. And I think when you're a Muslim woman, you are um, imprisoned in that you believe in Allah and you want him to be true. So you think, OK, maybe there's a wisdom behind it. Maybe um, I was told by my dad is because w women are protected. Yeah, you're so uh, your brother inherits twice as much as you do, because one day he'll look after you if something happened to me. That that was the because men look after right sisters. Yeah, I, of course I heard that uh, all the time. Uh, absolutely. What uh, do you, you think know, of that? Well, of course, uh, when when I was a Muslim, uh, I I felt like that's the right thing to do and the right way to think because that's what my God says. I am superior. I am a, a degree above. I am the one who's going to be providing. I mean, I I've always you know thought about okay, I'm getting twice as much money because I'll end up spending it. You know, that, that was the justification where a female will be getting half of that, but she's not going to spend it, right? You know, she's not going to be working. She's going to be staying home and provided for. Of course, that's the uh, rosy side of the story. You don't get to talk about, okay, and with that comes what? A second degree, abuse, all kind of things, obviously. Mm. Well, the brother thing, uh, Al-Fadi, I didn't find that to be true. Once the father of the family dies, everybody takes the inheritance and they go their different ways. The brother doesn't usually look That's after this. <laughs> uh, he just will spend it on his wife and kids. Why would he spend it on his sister? Do you see what I'm saying? Um, so, yeah, that, that I mean, you kind of swallow it. You, 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 you just grit my teeth and just take it and think, OK, maybe it's a lack of my understanding. That's another thing about Islam. It will make you think you're crazy. For thinking different if you think because everybody else you think well everybody else can't be wrong if they all think that and allah can't be wrong and all the muslims around me can't be wrong all the scholars can't be wrong the fuqaha you know you start to question your own sanity your own consciousness and um, that's what islam does but then like i said to you brother because i came to the west you start seeing something other than islam you start seeing people live differently. Like I was told back home that everybody knows Islam is true, but they're just denying it. You know, everybody knows, but they they just rejecting it. When I came to the West, people in school and college, they've never heard of Allah, Muhammad, some of them. So how come Allah will punish them? Do you see? It was, it was uh, the stuff that you hear uh, in Muslim countries is not always true in reality, outside Muslim countries. So... And Go on, go on. Sorry, before you jump into the next uh, part of your story, someone was asking, did you ever also think or question the idea that uh, Muhammad was in a cave by himself and he encountered an angel? And on account of this, somehow he is now declared a prophet. Better yet, have you even uh, did you even come across the story how his wife Khadija convinced him that he was a prophet? I'm just curious, someone is asking, and I'm also curious how you were processing these things. Yes, yes, I did. I heard uh, the story, uh, and I read uh, the seerah as, as well myself, but I read, um, and I heard the story of him and Khadija, and she took some of her clothes off and all this stuff, told him to go to the, sit on her thighs and all that stuff. But you, you, the way they say it, the way they say the story, they glorify Khadija and Muhammad. They don't say it how it is written in the seerah. So they say, oh... He, he hadn't had an encounter with Allah before. Khadija, look how good a wife she was. She comforted him. She was a believing wife. They say it in that way. So they make it sound complimentary. They, they add their own, the way you tell a story, and they change it, the tone of it, 
when whereas if you actually read it for what it was it's ridiculous you know he i'm pretty sure what he experienced in that cave was demonic because when you, when you read the god's word you know an angel is usually a reassuring uh, presence absolutely do not be afraid <laughs> absolutely so why did that angel tell him not to be afraid and why did it press him that sounds like a demonic attack but obviously as a muslim you don't know that yeah and why do we have surat al-muddathir al-muzammil i mean both of them if you read just the background behind it he was terrified to death literally about what he has encountered I mean, the guy was honest enough to say, you know what, I, I'm not buying what I saw. I mean, I feel like there is demons here, you know, and yet his wife convinced him that he is a prophet. And the test was hilarious. Of course, we don't want to get into these details. So anyway, I'm sorry to distract you, but I wanted to have some some level of interactions about those things. So so now you're in the West. You're beginning yeah. to see the difference. Yeah. What happened next? Uh, like I told you, brother, I was um, desperately unhappy. Uh, because of the lack of reassurance from Allah and also because I felt that anytime even when I do good works I was bribing Allah I was telling him look I'm giving this much charity for you make sure you write 10 hasanat 10 good works for me and while I was thinking that I was thinking what are you doing that's bad to think that to think that you're bribing God so that was my conscience almost uh, that, that's not a good thing to try and bribe him you should do it because it's good, or, you know. So Allah, the way Allah, Islam is structured is that it drives you to want to bribe Allah to gain his pleasure. But then when you do, you feel guilty. And it's, it's this constant cycle of guilt and shame and trying again. So uh, I wanted an end to it. I wanted to know that I was right with Allah and that, that that's it. Uh, and the way that was available to me, brother, was uh, Hajj. As you know, because uh, there's a hadith that says, if you do Hajj, uh, you come back as a, a, a newborn baby, all your sins will be forgiven. That's hadith in Muslim, hadith 422. Uh, Muhammad says, Allah will uh, replace you, uh, sorry, uh, Allah will, um, he will take your sins away and you'll come back, uh, you'll come back as a newborn baby. And, and I remember I, I asked you this question when we were, uh, you know, visiting for the first time. And as you know, dear sister, that there are a number of opinions about what is meant here by uh, returning back to be in a state as if you're a baby, meaning innocent with no sin. Yeah. Now, I don't know if you were exposed to these uh, uh, opinions or not. There is a number of opinions. One will say what you just said, of course, that literally all of your sins are taken away. You return back to a baby and you start all over again. The second one says... All of your sins except the major ones, you know, like if you killed, for instance, or or fornicated or did something. Mm -hmm. And a third one says, it's only taking your sins for the last year, the year when you have performed the pilgrimage. Were you exposed to any of these different opinions? Of course, if you go to the commentaries, as you know, they give you like pages upon pages, like Ibn Kathir, may he rest in peace. And at the end, he tells us, and Allah knows best. I'm like, you wasted <laughs> like 10 minutes of my time. You could have told me this at the beginning. <laughs> you should have started with Allah knows best. Uh, yes, brother. E even with the most reassuring thing in Islam, even that, that there's doubt. But I, because I believe in Sahih Hadith, um, sorry about the reference to Sahih, was Sahih Bukhari 1521. I, I believed in the one that says, whoever performs Hajj for Allah's pleasure uh, and does not do evil or sins, then he will return after Hajj free from all sins as if he was born new. But um, the, the way we understood the hadith brother me and my family and people back home is that once you get back home the the meter for sin starts again the sin start to reaccumulate uh once you've done the hajj anyway uh so it's almost like it wipes everything up to that point so even that's really not good enough if you think about it because as soon as you get home you have to start again <laughs> but i wanted that because I wanted that because that was the closest thing, you know, even if it meant a short time of being close to, well, I thought it was God, being close to Allah and being right with him. Even if it's a short time, I wanted it. That's how desperate I was. I was desperate for forgiveness, even if it was short lived. So I went to Hajj. Um, I took my dad. I spent all my life, my savings on it. It's very expensive, you know, as you know, but well, you're Saudi brother. You, you had the privilege. Well, shouldn't say privilege being there 
I, I have to say, I used to ache for people I know that they have spent all of their life saving just to come to that place, come to realize that I'm sure it was a huge disappointment. Yeah. Well, when I, exactly, exactly. So I, yeah, you know, I spent my, my a lot of money and I, you know, the build up to it and everybody's saying, oh, you're going to Hajj, you're going to get your sins forgiven, you buy clothes, you know, their clothes and all that. And then when I went there, it was, it was just chaos, brother. It was chaos. I saw grown men act like fools, pushing each other. And then when they get to the Kaaba, they're um, uh, touching it, they're rubbing it, the stones, they're kissing it, they're crying. They're, they're grown people acting like fools. That's what I saw. And uh, pushing each other, uh, hurting each other, you know, pushing away women, kids. They didn't care. They wanted that forgiveness bad, badly. They, they were they were as desperate as I was, and I was with them. And it looked to me like it's ridiculous. It looked bizarre. Um, and uh, I just thought, what what is this? What what am I doing? <laughs> I just had this moment of clarity that I'm in the middle of this chaos. And is God happy with this? Is this what he wants to see? Is this, he just wants to laugh at us? Because I'm sure it's laughable to him, you know, from a, looking from above at, you know, adults acting silly, basically. And uh, if you follow the, the rituals of Hajj, there's a place where you do the Sai, I told you, brother. It's a place where you uh, run from um, the two mountains, the Safa and Marwa, that you run seven times. You're meant to walk and then you get to a point and you're meant to run and then slow down again. So I saw people, then you, they get to that point, they mark it on the ground, and then you, you run. And some people couldn't run, they were waddling, they were laughing, it was, like, it was like a joke. I was thinking, this is a joke. And so many stones in worship, it's not just the black stone, you know? Um, you know, the Jamarat, where people throw stones at stone pillars, it's just so many stones. And uh, if, if people weren't shouting at a stone of the devil, they were rubbing another stone and kissing it, I was like, what is this? How, how did you feel about this? I mean, did, did this just for a second give you the impression that there is something paganistic about this? Yeah, like I said, because I had come to the West, I've seen Hindus and how they treat the gods, their statues. They rub them the same way they, it did, it did feel pagan, it did. And um, it felt wrong. Even though I'd seen it on TV, nothing prepares you for when you're in it. And I thought this is just, so inside me, I felt it was wrong. And also I thought, God is, he's just laughing at us. He's just, we, he just, we're entertainment to him. This is ridiculous. So I spent all my money just to do this. Sorry, go, go on, bro. Especially the running part, right? You know, uh, did, you, did you win every time you run? Did you, oh. you defeat all the others who are running with you? I won, yeah. And people used to race. I'm sure, brother, you went. People will be like, okay, when we run, let's see how far I get. And you run fast and you, you see people waddling behind and they're laughing. Um, I thought, so this is this is just joke. You know, I still did it though. <laughs> it just shows you how deep the brainwashing is. It didn't stop me. I still finished the rituals because I spent all that money and I, I wanted to get my money's worth. <laughs> yeah. And and if, if you don't mind, just I'm gonna summarize to people what's going on. You pray towards a rock, you go there and you touch that rock. And there is another rock that you kiss called the black stone. You run between two rocks. You go and stone rocks. And yet everybody is convinced, actually, that it's a religion that denies idolatry. I mean, go figure. Absolutely, brother. And then when you read about it, actually, before Islam, um, the pag this were, these were pagan practices that Islam just adopted. Uh, and so it seemed like it was a religion that just stole some Bible stories through through a bit of you know the Arab paganism that was in there, and it was it was just like a mix, mix and match religion for the time. So, so what happened? So <laughs> what an exciting experience. I hope no rocks hit your head. By the way, no, no rocks hit my head. I and God protected me. By the way, I didn't kiss the black stone because I couldn't get there, brother. You know because obviously you've been there, how crowded it is. Oh, absolutely. I can tell you how many times I fought people just to get there. Yeah, so I wasn't strong enough to fight uh, the grown men that were there. And they people would get there and they would stand there for a long time and kiss it a few more times, really go in there. They wouldn't just kiss it and walk off, you know? So it was too crowded for me. I think God protected me. 
uh, God protected me from a lot of evil that was there as well. Um, as I know, I'm sure you know, brother. And I just thank God. I thank him. I, I know that it grieved him that I did that, um, that I participated in it. Even though I could feel my, my conscience was telling me this was wrong, I still did it. And um, I, I could... Amen. Uh, I could sense the um, the emptiness. I, I, when I came back, it was worse. Um, I was more unhappy. I didn't find the prize at the end that was promised. All your sins forgiven and closeness to Allah. I didn't. That was an empty promise. It was false. And why, why do you say that? I mean, was it the feeling that you felt immediately after concluding this ritual? Yeah, and also because I, I questioned Allah in His holy place as well. Uh, I knew He could see my thinking that. I think this is ridiculous. Uh, so how is he going to forgive that now? That you still you don't do that as a Muslim. You don't think those things of Allah and his and his rituals of the Hajj especially. And uh, I rebelled against him for the first time in my heart. I rebelled against this Allah, and I thought he was ridiculous and he is bizarre and he delights in just find making people do bizarre things. And he just wants to be entertained by us, basically. That's what I thought about Allah. And I came back and, um, I, I, like I said, the empty promises, the feeling is one of them, but also that I didn't want to worship him anymore. And um, I found myself just, I didn't, I couldn't buy it anymore. Uh, I was moving away from all worship. You know, people say when you come back from Hajj, you're meant to be closer. <laughs> so my family was saying, you, you know, act like a Hajjah, you know, you don't act... Uh, you, you, you know, missing prayers. You, um, I was so disillusioned and so let down. You know, why was I trying everything? And he, why, why isn't he trying to reach me? Why is it only one way? You know, why am I always guessing what he's thinking and uh, wanting him to love me, to accept me, to to be pleased with me? Why isn't he doing the same for me? Where is he? And um, I remember I said to him. Why uh, did you give me this heart that can't feel anything? Why didn't you give me this heart that can't feel your presence? Uh, you just you just created me just to, to just jump through hoops all my life without knowing anything where I stand with you. Why don't I know where I stand with you? And uh, I, I said to him, uh, you're up there on your throne. You don't know what it's like to be a human. I said that to Allah. Obviously, now I know he does know what it's like to be human. You know, he came as Jesus Christ. But I didn't know that at the time. And uh, I just said, I'm done with you now. Wow, totally. that's amazing that you even think that way. Wow. Yeah, so I was done. Uh, I still prayed for show with my family just to keep everyone, um, to please everyone. But I, in my heart, I'd just given up, given up on him. Uh, unfortunately, Islam, it, the more, it, it, it distorts God's image so much that it makes people. It make. It made me uh, give up on him, and it, it made people give up on him. Now, um, the big atheist movement, I believe, brother, is because how much us Islam distorted the image of God. Can Can you repeat? Can you repeat it one more time? Because some Muslims are in denial that there is a huge atheist movement in the Middle East among young Muslims. There's definitely. Uh, many many people moving away from uh, Islam to into atheism and I say the reason for that is how much Islam has distorted the image of God the image of uh, God in Islam is so false it makes you give up on him uh, he's this temperamental God that can be with you one day and against you the next day uh, he's very changeable you can't trust him he's maker you know he's this a deceiver what kind of God is this? So, in a way, um, the most wronged, we, we th you know, Muslims are wronged by Islam, but the most wronged person in Islam is God, the image of God. He doesn't mind about Muhammad's uh, immoralities. He allows him to marry a child. He allows him to marry his uh, son, uh, adopted son's wife. He allows him many wives. He allows him to uh, break his oath. If that's a God, eventually if you think a little bit you say if that's god i don't want him and that's what happened to me but the difference with me is that christ caught me i didn't go into atheism and i thank god for that 
Amen. And 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 I want to just make a uh, quick reference to our friend Adil Ahmed, who uh, told us that he is from Yemen. And and Adil, I want you to slow it down with the cot. You know, showing cot, you know, can affect the brain. Uh, not to mention, of course, any diseases that will happen to your to your mouth. You're saying in your comment, uh, talking to someone here, savior of my soul, and saying, I'm beyond smart and sophisticated, and that's why I will be. MU dash slim for eternity. Are you ashamed of typing the word Muslim? But you are slim for sure without Christ, because without Christ, you will never, ever, my friend, have any fellowship with God. You're not going to even smell heaven. So you will be slim, unfortunately, for all of eternity, but only Christ fills you up, my friend. Only Christ will fill you up. Here is a dear sister who went and performed a pilgrimage. And what was her experience? Del disillusion, basically. She came back empty rather than to be filled. Only Christ will fill you up. Only the Holy Spirit of God will dwell in you. So think about that, my friend. Okay, dear sister, I just wanted to comment on him because he's been just uh, distracting everybody right now. Yeah, brother, he does uh, what I uh, call slogans. Muslims, we're told slogans. Uh, slogans are like these big statements with nothing to back them up. I'll be Muslim forever. Islam is the greatest. Allah is the great. Muhammad is the best. I see a lot of them when they feel threatened with the capital letters, all these slogans come up with nothing to back them up. And uh, I was taught the same thing. You know, uh, yeah, I'll be Muslim for forever. I'll go to Jannah. I used to say that uh, I'll be Muslim till the end. But thank, thank God. Thank God he didn't listen to that. <laughs> Uh, you know he you know god is god is good um so what happened what happened was um brother the the turning point for me sorry do you want to say something oh no i mean i was going to ask you because people are anxious for that moment <laughs> but we don't want to you know say it immediately i mean we want to build up uh, this anxiety you know to get there because i want them to drink tea like i'm doing right now so go for it so um the turning point for me came when um my nephew was born a baby in the family was born and it was the first time that I loved a human being more than myself even though he wasn't you know directly it wasn't my child who was I was his aunt but I loved that baby so much um and it it, it came to a point where I a thought came to me I wish Allah loved me as much as I love this baby and that's when it dawned on me that the God of Islam is not true because how can I love more than God can love? You know, that would make me greater than God. How, my capacity of love can't be more than Allah's. So if, because I know I would do anything for that baby. And I've been doing so much for Allah, trying to reach him for years, thousands of prayers, sincere prayers, I might add, and nothing back from him except uh, disappointments and disillusion and no answered prayers, by the way misery, uh, no forgiveness that I could uh, be reassured of. And yet I would do anything for that baby, but he can't do anything for me, you know, the same for me. So it just dawned on me and I thought, oh, i still believed in God because um, I wasn't going to be atheist because I knew God existed. There's, I always, you know, knew that um, there's a designer, but if God is not in Islam, then where is he? That's mm. why I came to that point. Wow. Wow. So, um, yeah. I, I spoke directly to God. I didn't do it with any wudu, with any washing. I didn't face Mecca. Hallelujah. I, Hallelujah. I just, I just looked up at him. I prayed how Christians pray, but I didn't know that's how Christian prayed. And I did it instinctively. I just looked at the sky and spoke to God and I said, uh, I want the truth. Give me the truth. I know you. I know. I know you're not here. Where are you? I want the truth. I don't. I don't care where you are. I will follow you. Um, but I know it's not here. So, um, and I, I asked. I asked every day, not just once. I asked. I asked every day. God, the truth, please, the truth. Where's the truth? God, the truth. And in all that time, I didn't look into any other religions, uh, as you know, because of the brainwashing, the you know, the three gods of Christianity, the many gods of Hinduism, the uh, philosophies of Sikhism, you know. I was, that brainwashing was still in me, so I didn't go into any religions. I just spoke to God directly, and I didn't ask anyone. 
else. I didn't ask a human being, I just asked God. Um, and then a few weeks after that, I was online and um, I had clicked on a YouTube video of uh, a Muslim speaking to a Christian. And I heard for the first time a Christian who knew Jesus Christ, a Christian who knew Jesus Christ. Uh, and he talked about him in a way that was so sure that he had no doubt he was he had conviction uh he he's he spoke about he spoke with 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 authority you know and i could hear the 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 you know the pulse the pulse of truth in his voice and he had a look on his face uh that i never saw a look uh, of a muslim before a look that who is somebody who is sure of god no muslim is ever sure of god on what god will do it to him after death but that person did and that what that was what drew me to him and he made a point to the muslim that you know he said even in the quran allah is called the word, um sorry jesus is called is called the word of allah the word of god and obviously we muslims i was um, i'm a sunni muslim we know the word of god is eternal so if jesus is the word of god then jesus must be eternal and that was a logical point that i'd never thought of because i'd read that verse in the quran many times and i never thought of it that way and uh, it it almost it, it was like a key for me something clicked and um i i wouldn't say i believed at that point but he made a logical point and it was almost like i was i had i was desperate for an answer and then i got i got a flash of light you know and uh, i i need i needed to see where that led you know so uh i i thank i thank brothers and sisters like yourselves who are into apologetics and polemics because that's how i came to christ Praise the Lord. How, how so? Because I get pushed back a lot sometimes that apologetics is not really the way to invite people to Christ. And I try to convince people that it's a calling, first of all, it's biblical, you know, that's most important. And on top of this, dealing with our Muslim friends requires and demands that you do apologetics, like it or not, of course. So how did you feel about you know, the tone of apologetics. I mean, I know sometimes it's tough. You hear things that you don't want to hear. I remember, you know, my wife heard things about the, the prophet of Islam at the beginning, which in my view, the people who approached her about that from the uh, from day one did not do the right protocol. You do not go and meet someone for the first time and begin to attack the prophet that they follow. That's not what I, I promote. That's not what we try to uh, do, of course. But apologetic has a role in witnessing, especially to people like Muslims. Did you feel that it was helpful for you to begin to understand and process what's going on absolutely and I, I i'm eternally grateful to that person and other people who i heard online but remember the quran is polemic the quran attacks you first the quran attacks christians first he says so they they set the tone and if you don't defend then your silence means that you agree that's the first thing second uh, as you, you know, brother, Muslims are used to things being drummed into them. Yeah. So the tough approach is, I think, if, if you do it with love and sincerity, is actually effective. The gentle approach, um, I am afraid, is seen by Muslims as weakness, um, unfortunately. If you come with kindness and love and seem to them like, even if you make good points, they listen to your tone and they listen to your, um, if you're not, talking with boldness and with conviction that you have no doubt this is the truth and anything else is uh, Satan who's dragging you to hell, then it's not, first of all, it might not get the attention of Muslims. And second, they think you're weak because the Quran sets that tone. The Quran says, it's I'm the truth and everything else is uh, going to hell. And it attacks Christians personally. Uh, it rebukes Christians. So you have to answer, you have to defend and if you love someone and you see them going to hell and you don't do anything, that's not love. And uh, yeah. Amen. And, and I just want to make a quick comment uh, before I let, uh, you know, continue. Uh, someone, um, I'm not going to put the comment here by the name of Abbas Agha. And I just want to apologize. Um, uh, his comment is that you somehow were fooled by Satan. Yeah. Um, did you feel at any point after you accepted Christ, and throughout your journey with him for a second that you have done something that you shouldn't have done or you feel doubts about this eternal decision 
Never, never. And I'm not surprised he says that because that's what my family said. This is Satan that's moving you away. But it's funny that Satan would give me peace of uh, peace in my heart. It's funny that Satan would uh, <laughs> answer prayers. You know, obviously Satan can't do that. Uh, Satan gives happiness. I didn't know that. Uh, Satan, uh, all the promises that are in uh, the Bible, they come true. I didn't know that. That's I've yeah. never regretted that. Sorry. Not to mention that Satan himself, according to the Quran, promised that he's going to make the life of human beings miserable. Yeah. Why? Because they caused him to be kicked out of heaven. If, if at least our friends here know anything about what the Quran teaching. And it's funny you said that about Satan, but I want to add, it's funny how Satan actually appeared as an angel to a prophet. Funny how Satan actually gave him a revelation about a lot the satanic verses. I wonder who was deceived by Satan. That's the question that we need to ask. Yeah, and um, I'm not surprised that Muslims do that. Even Jesus himself was uh, accused of, um, you know, being the, you know, the, the leader of um, demons. Remember, because he did uh, wonders. So I'm not surprised that we would be called that. But um, all I know is I called that for God. And he answered. So if he let Satan answer for him, then he can't blame me for following that. Uh, what happened next with me, brother, is that uh, I started reading about Jesus Christ because of what the, that brother uh, said about Jesus uh, being the word of Allah, being the word of God and being eternal. And I came to a point where I didn't know which side was right for sure. Because the Muslim side says, if you believe Jesus is God, you're going to hell because he's a man. But the Christian side was saying, if you don't believe Jesus is God, you're going to hell because he's God. So I was at that point. I was reading about Christ, but I had my Islamic upbringing. So they were both fighting. So I needed to know for sure which one. Um, and uh, God was gracious to me because I watched someone who said, again, in apologetics and polemics, he was saying, if you don't know, ask Jesus himself. So... I thought, well, okay, it's this about Jesus, so it's a logical thing. If it's about Jesus's identity, then why not just ask him? And if you know, if he if he can he can answer if he's able, and if he is God, he will be able to answer it. So I I phrased it in such a way that I wouldn't make Allah angry. I know it sounds really silly. <laughs> I I I would say I I I just say to uh, Allah if he asks me, I'll just say I was just making sure. So I just so I I went down on my knees like that man suggested and I said Jesus if you are like what Christians are saying show me and um that moment brother I still can't describe it fully it was it was like I was in another world for about a minute I I felt brilliant love and safety and happiness and joy and complete completeness and hallelujah it was like I was embraced by holiness by someone holy and pure and i was completely changed in that moment i mean rabbi barakak ukhti rabbi barakak it's 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 amazing uh, indeed and that's what we all feel uh, when we accept our amazing savior who mm -hmm. offered us his amazing grace and who does amazing transformations for us from within from within, mm -hmm. I was preaching recently from John chapter 7, verses 37 to 44. And you can see how Jesus was asking people to come to him because he can give them that overflowing rivers of flowing waters that will transform them from within. That's his Holy Spirit that will be given to us. Where in fact, you know, you have to fill yourself up all the time with repetitions, you know, mm -hmm. as a follower of Islam and you're still empty. That's what's so amazing about the contrast between the two. Amen. Amen, brother. And ever since that day, I've never felt um, sadness. All the sadness was gone. The anxiety was gone. The, the fear, you know, the terror was gone. Uh, the, the, the restlessness, remember, the emptiness that I was talking about was completely filled. And I, I was a... Technically, I'm Muslim, still Muslim at the time. I couldn't believe it. I was shocked. I didn't. I didn't expect this. There was nothing in me to expect it. You know, I wasn't 
it's not like I grew up in a, a Christian environment or anything. So this to me was, uh, I was just doing it as an experiment just to see. And uh, I'd asked God for the truth and it, and, and it was here. And I, I could tell that Jesus is, you know, once I said his name, these things started happening. I went out and bought, bought a Bible, brother, and I read it for the first time. I could not believe the the God, the God who's in the Bible is the God that I always wanted Allah to be, but it never was. He's, he's uh, loving, he's uh, long suffering, he he loves his people. He doesn't he doesn't uh, threaten them, you know, to replace them like uh, Allah in the Quran does. He 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 he's patient with them. He 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 loves them. He uh, he doesn't tempt people to sin. He wants everyone to come to a, a knowledge of the truth. And um, he came down to earth. He did something that Allah of the Quran never did. He bothered to come down to us. Allah is on the yeah. throne. In the sky, it doesn't care. Subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Yeah. Instead of Subhanahu wa ta'ala only, our God, yes, ta'ala, but he tanazal also. He yeah. went down. He's not elevated, seated on his throne. Yes, exactly, brother. The God of the Bible is the opposite of the God of Islam. The God of the Bible is like you said, brother. You know, Jesus Christ, he's humble, he's lowly. He emptied himself. He emptied himself uh, for, for my sake. He came down to my level. Allah wants you to wants you to go up to his level but he came down to me and he's a god who died for people whereas Allah wants you to die for him he wants you to die for him but he the, the real god died for for me he took the the the, the, the extra mile he took that step and uh, I was I was just shocked the love that I wanted to feel for from Allah was all in the bible it was all in the Bible. The Psalms is it, all the comfort you could ever think that you ever want is in the Psalms, and um, it would even though the Bible was new to me in terms of his of the words, it it felt familiar, felt like a familiar voice. You know, like when uh, Jesus Christ talks about how to pray, like we talked about before, where you know uh, he says, "Pray, go to go into your room and pray to your Father in secret," and he condemns people. Who pray uh, in the street corners? Sorry, brother. No, take your time. Uh, yeah, the way he can he he condemns people who pray in the street corners, and I always you know um, wondered about that. Why do we need to be seen to pray? Why can't we just go to pray in our rooms? Jesus said it. It's like he knew my thoughts. And again, when about fasting, he says, when you fast. Uh, anoint your head and wash your face uh, that um, that your fasting may not be seen by others. When Muslims fast, everybody knows Ramadan. And even, you know, Muslims say, Allahumma ni sa'im, <laughs> you know. they When someone crosses them, you know, make them angry, or say, oh, I'm fasting. Everybody knows you're fasting. So Jesus is like the God who was with me all the time. He knew my thoughts. And I'm just reading about him for the first time, that it was like coming home. And even though the Quran... I knew the Quran, I was more familiar with the Quran than the Bible. The Quran always didn't sit right with me, always felt like an abrasive foreign voice, but the voice of Jesus was familiar. And um, I, I spent many, you know, many weeks in complete joy that I'm discovering this almost like a treasure, this secret, this, this new amazing way that God made for me. And I, I like I said, I, I, felt, I felt new. I felt like I was a different person. I, I had a different spirit in me. Um, I was changed, and uh, I was I was then reading about later on the epistles when it talks about you being a new creation. I was thinking, oh, this is happening to me. So it was confirming <laughs> what's happening to me. And uh, I, al I also um, I felt my, the spiritual blindness lifting. And so when I would read verses of the Quran, when I would read back to the Quran, look back. I realized how disturbing and satanic this is. The, the, the veil was lifted completely, and I could see the difference. Uh, I um, I felt the heaviness of my sin that I, I the crimes that I did against God. You know that every time I stood to face that idol in Mecca to pray towards that, I I I I, I grieved him. That any time I uh, glorified Muhammad, it, it pained him. And every time I denied his son, I broke his heart. I, I, it all was all. It all became clear. It was like 
it all dawned on me, you know, the heaviness of this, the heaviness of what I did against God. Even in ignorance, I still did it. And like I said, I did all the, completed all the Hajj worship, even though I knew it was wrong. And um, I understood, you know, deeply understood why Jesus had to die because I couldn't carry this. So he, he had to. And, um, I cr I, you know, I cried. I was broken over it. And um, I thanked him for, for taking the sin from me and I repented to him. And um, he took me in. Jesus Christ, he took me in. And um, I, like I said, I was, I, was, I was joyful. I was light. Amen. Well, we have a question relevant to what you're saying. Uh, uh, one of our friends, his name is Salih Abdullahi Bilkasra. You know, so here, here's what, uh, what he's saying. Uh, Allah loves you. So that's why he gave us many chances to turn back to him. And that's why he gave us guidance after guidance. Yet we still deny. Dear sister, how many times did you read Surah Al-Fatiha asking Allah for guidance on a daily basis? Where is this guidance that uh, our friend here is talking about? Uh, can you give me one verse in the Quran where uh, it says Allah loves you? Just oh, of tell, course. That's a whole me, different tell, story. Tell me where, where it is that Allah loves you. And uh, by the way, Allah says that he uh, guides whom he will and he misguides whom he will. And when Not you're only that, but yeah, every time you read, sirat al -mustaqim, my goodness, yeah. why do you have to ask for guidance if he's already has given it to you? Yeah. Why do you keep asking asking over and over and over for guidance 17 times a day? If Allah is so good, why don't he just guide you? Uh, and by the way, uh, to, that, to that person, uh, it's written already whether Allah has guided you or not. There's a hadith that says for every person in the womb who Allah creates, he writes, you know, his uh, ajal, you know, his, how old he, he will be and whether he will be guided or misguided, chaqay or sa'id. He, he already predestines you to it. And that's what broke me about Allah is. Oh, you, you, have, just, already... you have just given Saleh some bad news. You've given Saleh some bad news. He's going to be having nightmares now about this. Salah, he's already decided whether or not you're guided or not. And and then punishes you when you're misguided. It's just incredible. It's um, it's like he's playing a game with you. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a big theater, no doubt. It's a big theater. So look, it, it was a big it was a big thing for me to leave Allah. You know, I lost my my whole family. If he was gonna guide me and give me all this good stuff, I didn't have to leave him. Um, so it, by the way, the hadith that I talked about is in Sahih Bukhari 318. At every go womb, Allah, yeah, go on, yeah, go ahead, read it play, uh, first. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, the Prophet said, At every womb, Allah appoints an angel who says, Oh Lord, a drop of semen, oh Lord, a clot, oh Lord, a little lump of flesh. Then, if Allah wishes to complete his creation, the angel asks, Will it be a male or female? wretched or blessed so that means will it go to heaven or um, to ajanna or to paradise or to hell how much will it provision his provision be and what will his age be and so it that all that is written all that is written while the child is still in the mother's womb yeah so, and, uh, and you know what is so sad of course for our friend here he probably never heard of this hadith and here's what's even more sad now they're going to come back and say oh that, that hadith you know we don't we don't really pay attention to these hadith anymore you yeah. know they could be fabricated it could be weak you know those are just made up traditions to try to justify things it's funny how the islam in the west now is evolving into a new islam i call it the new islamic movement actually uh it's also in the quran brother uh, he guides oh, maybe, him. Maybe he it was abrogated. Are you sure? You know, it wasn't abrogated. It wasn't abrogated. He I'm guides. Just trying, him. I'm just trying to think like them. I mean, I'm just trying to help them here. He guides whom he will, and he misguides whom he will. Uh, he says that many, many times. Uh, and also, Allah, if He wants to misguide you, He sends you, He sends you devils. He sends you devils to tempt you to do wrong. You find that in Surah 17, verse 16. Uh, uh, sorry, sorry, in Surah 19, verse uh, 83 as well. Uh, have you not seen that we unleash the devils upon the faithless to urge them? We unleash the devils. Is Allah the king of the devils? That he unleashes the devil? Is, are they, uh, is he the boss of the devil? So if 
Allah decides that he doesn't want you, you know, because he creates creation and then discards them. Yeah, he doesn't care about humans. He sends a devil to tempt you to sin. So when you sin, he then punishes you. What kind of God do you serve? Definitely not the God, the, the real God who cares for the yeah, I want to mention something, though. Uh, Vishal, uh, I think you're on the wrong channel, actually. We're not here promoting Krishna, by the way. We're talking about Jesus. Just for you to put some money here, you think like we're going to be falling for this? Uh, I don't think so, my friend. So take your money, please, and go somewhere else. Thank you. All right. Um, all right, dear sister. Well, um, let me just make a teaser for people. Uh, we're not going to have time to do this, uh, the exercise that I ask you to do. But uh, our dear sister agreed to come back again. And maybe we may end up doing a couple of video series on examples where the Islamic sources, what I mean by that is Quran and Hadith, have plagiarized or uh, plagiarized, I should say, or took some thoughts, ideas, doctrines, teachings, even verses sometimes from the Bible and applied it to either the mouth of the prophet of Islam or the teachings in the Quran. And I think that will be an interesting thing simply because, you know, some of those come from the mouth of Paul. Oops, did I mention Paul? I mean, that's terrible, actually. I thought Paul was a horrible, horrible person, but apparently the God of Islam and his prophet never thought bad about the guy, you know, but it's amazing how our modern Muslim friends receive different revelations than their God and their sources when it comes to Paul and the teaching of the Bible. Dear sister, thank you so much uh, for being here with us. Any last thoughts that you want to conclude with, uh, whether uh, you want to talk directly to uh, our Muslim friends, to the audience, or any last thoughts you want to share? Uh, I want the Muslims to come to the Lord Jesus Christ. I know they're looking for God. They're looking for guidance, and they can't find it. When I read the Bible, the true word of God, I realized that the God of Islam is uh, the deceiver. You see, we've been told that the scriptures that came before the Quran, they were corrupted and the Quran came to correct them. The truth is, the Bible is true, the Quran is the imposter. And it's basically the opposite of everything you've been told. All I can say to them is, if you're not sure, ask Jesus like I did. Ask, dare to ask Allah, dare to ask God, the God who created you, say to him, where are you? Are you in this Islam or are you somewhere else? And when, when you do that with sincerity, I guarantee that God doesn't, um, God doesn't let you down. He, he's a, what I realized about God, brother, is that he is a God who wants to be found. He doesn't hide from you like Allah does. He doesn't have to be chased. You know, he wants to be found. He, he, and the day of salvation is today. He's standing on the door and knocking, Jesus Christ, waiting for you to just open your heart a little bit so he can come in. And your salvation, your eternity is worth the risk. And what I learned about Allah of Islam is he's just, um, he's just like a, bo a boogeyman. He's, he's, a, he's, he's a fictional character. You know, people are afraid of, of him for nothing. When I dared to question him and say, enough, I'm not jumping through any more hoops until I know if you're real or not. When I, rebe I rebelled against him around the Kaaba, and I'm still here, and I'm happier, I am blessed, I'm fulfilled. And the, the day I found happiness is the day Jesus Christ found me, and I've been happy ever since. And I don't need anything else now, except that he stay with me until the end, which I'm, sh I'm sure he will because he promises to. He's given me everything that Allah didn't give, because Allah is not real. Absolutely. He says, I will never leave you or forsake you. It cannot get any better than that. Dear sister, what advice do you give to Muslim women? And what advice do you give to those who are wandering towards Islam, especially female who think there is reality in Islam by converting? Uh, I say to them, read the Quran. And I know it sounds strange from somebody who left Islam to tell you. Educate yourself about what you're coming in. Don't do it for another person because I know the lady, a lot of the ladies who come to Islam, they do it for men. They do it for a Muslim husband. Uh, and I want to tell the Muslim women that you are more than what Allah and Muhammad tell you that you are. You are more than that. You were made in the image of God. God himself came and emptied himself and allowed himself to be killed in a horrific way 
to redeem you, to buy you back, to, to, to save you, to, to save your soul. So that means you have value. And that value was given to you by God himself. The value that Islam and Muhammad tried to take away from you. And you know they put you down. I don't have to tell Muslim women they've been put down despite their objections. They know full well they're less than in the eyes of Allah in front um, and in the eyes of Muhammad. You're not that, you're, you know. And when I when I came to Jesus Christ, I didn't get half the spirit, <laughs> you know, that my my brothers get. I am equal to them. God sees me, justifies me, just as He He spilled His blood for my brothers in Christ. He spilled it's the same way He spilled His blood for me. I am just as Christian as them. I'm not half of anything. Uh, so this is your value. Don't demean your value by following a religion that takes away from the God-given value that you have. That's all I say to them, brother. Amen. Thank you so much, really, for taking the time to be with us. And thank you also for agreeing to come back to do something uh, in that regard to help our Muslim friends begin to realize that there is more to the story than just emotions here. Uh, they have to learn to uh, dig deeper into facts these days, I, I personally can tell any Muslim, you are without excuse. You cannot use the excuse that I didn't know. You have YouTube, you have Facebook, you have Instagram, you have Snapchat, you have so many tools out there and you have websites that provides you with an answer for anything and everything you have in your mind. With that says, seek the truth. What are you intimidated about? What are If you're standing on, uh, on the truth, you shouldn't be afraid. Go and read for yourself, compare, and ask the real God, the true God, to reveal himself to you. You don't want to call him Jesus, up to you. But ask God, and God is faithful. He will not abandon you if you truly is seeking him with all your heart. You, see, you will seek me, uh, and you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. That's what uh, the Bible teaches. That's what our God says He's not a God that will run away from you. He's not a God that feels he's above you. He is a God that humbled himself, as our dear sister mentioned, to be with you, to walk with you. I will never, he says, and I will be with you until the end of the age. I mean, uh, it can't get any better than God, that the God of the universe, the creator of everything, is walking the walk with you. Thank you, dear sister. And uh, I hope that uh, you uh, will uh, you know, uh, consider coming back soon here to begin to do these particular video series and maybe even other topics, of course. In fact, at some point, it's really, I'm hoping that uh, yourself, Sister Khadija and others, maybe will have a panel discussion where we can talk about uh, meaningful topics related to our uh, Muslim women who needs to really uh, wake up to the reality that Jesus is the answer to anything that they are dealing with. Thank you for everyone being here. Thank you for those who gave through the Snapchat. And I just wanna explain what the person that I mentioned about Krishna gave money thinking that this will be a way to distract us and focus on the, atten uh, the attention on his, what he's given. We're not about you giving us money just to try to promote heresies and false teachings. That's not how it works here. We are above that and we don't like to be bought into ideological issues that are not biblical. So there is no Krishna, by the way. Krishna is a figment of someone's imagination, okay? Now, uh, we promote the truth, and the truth can be found in the Word of God, the Bible, and Jesus is real, and history is on our side to support this. Even non-Christians believe that he existed. So we're not going to sit here and try to make comparisons with false gods. With that says, thank you to our moderators for taking the time to be here with us, especially on a Sunday. Some of you even... Uh, it's already late past 10 o'clock or maybe even 11 o'clock at night, depending where you're at, some even past midnight. And I know some of you uh, said that it's past uh, already, you know, two or three in the morning. So thank you so much for being here with us. Uh, we will have some amazing lineup again next week, and we will have more testimonies like this. And yes, from other females along with male who left Islam and followed Jesus. So stay tuned. We'll be making this announcement in appropriate time. Thank you, dear sister. God bless you and God bless everyone. This is Al-Fadi over.